function. What would it look like if you were to take that function and rotate it about one of the axes? The result would be a three-dimensional solid made up of many circular disks. The radius of each slice is the distance from the axis of revolution to the function. Finding the volume of this solid might seem tricky at first, but we can use a simple idea that has amazing applications in calculus and beyond in the real world. Today we are going to talk about solids of revolution, which are an application of calculus. Solids of revolution are used in the manufacturing and engineering of pistons, bottles, axles, pills, and funnels. They can also be used for 3D modeling and 3D printing. Calculus can be used to measure the volumes of the unique shapes of different solids of revolution. For example, with the manufacturing of pills, you might have to calculate the volume of the bottle to determine how many pills you would be able to fit inside, or to find out the dosage you should put in each pill. Timpani drums are actually hemispherical or paraboloid. The shape of the bowl contributes to the quality of the drum. For example, hemispheric bowls produce brighter tones, while parabolic bowls produce darker tones. Calculating the drum's volume through solids of revolution allows you to produce drums of different pitches. The disc method is the first way to find the volume of a solid of revolution. A hot dog is rather like a cylinder, which would be a revolution of a line segment. We cut the hot dog into smaller and smaller discs to try to get the exact volume. This becomes integration when you add together the infinite number of circles in the cylinder. We can illustrate a slightly more complex use of the disc method using an apple. While the discs in the hot dog example all had the same radius, the apple approximates a sphere, so the radius of the discs will vary depending on where the apple is cut. Before slicing up the apple, we found its volume via displacement to be 121 cubic centimeters. It was about 5 centimeters high, so we marked off 1 centimeter slices. Then we cut the apple in half, measured the radius, and calculated the volume as if the apple were a single cylinder with a height of 5 centimeters. Obviously, this is going to be a gross overestimation of the volume, as the apple is clearly not a cylinder, but we can improve our estimate by slicing again. With two cuts, you now have two different radii. Here is a conceptual drawing of an apple as approximated by cylindrical disks. In the end, the approximate volumes we got were as follows. The approximations nicely approach the true volume of 121 cubic centimeters. The idea you're illustrating here is that as you use more and more disks, the approximation approaches the true volume. If you were to cut the apple into infinitely many, infinitesimally thin slices and add them up, you'd get the exact volume, which is what integrals allow you to do. For practice, we can do a simple problem. Let's start with the line y equals x over 2 revolving around the x-axis between x equals 0 and x equals 2. We can imagine as the line is rotated around, a cone is created. So to set up the problem, our integral is from 0 to 2. In this case, where we are going about the x-axis, the radius of the infinitely thin cylinders, or circles, is the y value, or x over 2. As you can see more clearly with a strawberry, the disks don't have to be of a similar size. A strawberry is closer to a cone shape, and we can see how the disks increase in radius from the tip to the top of the strawberry. Bagel is another food that can be used to visualize the washer method. The bagel itself represents the space between two curves that is rotated around an axis. Washers can be used to approximate the volume depending on each radius and width. Now consider a spherical marble sitting at the bottom of a hemispherical bowl. If we pour water into the bowl, how would we find the volume that the water takes up? When we plot this on a coordinate plane, we can see that this is clearly a solid of revolution. What's interesting about this example is that it illustrates both disks and washers. When the water level is lower than the height of the marble, the slices of water are washers because the marble is creating the hole in the middle. However, once we fill the bowl up past the marble, the slices become disks. Here is an illustration of an example washer and disk. Thus far, both disks and washers slice up the solid perpendicular to the axis which you revolved the function around. To use these two methods, you had to put the function in term of, terms of the axis you were revolving around. For example, if you were spinning around the x-axis, your formula would have to be y equals the formula of x's. However, sometimes this is difficult or even impossible. Here is where shells come into play. I'm going to introduce you to the geometric idea of shells and the notion of nesting of shells to obtain an approximation of the volumes of solids of revolution. 
The method of shells is based on filling a solid with cylindrical shells. Central to the development of the method of shells is the idea of nesting or layering the approximating elements. The notion of nesting can be introduced using Russian dolls, which are dolls of various sizes fit together compactly. Another example is the onion, which is made up of nested layers. We can approximate the volume of the entire onion by calculating the volumes of each of the layers. Now, let's do a practice problem using the cylindrical shells method. The function I'm going to use is y equals negative x squared plus x, which is just a parabola opening downwards, and the line y equals zero, which is just the x-axis. You can find the x-intercepts by simply setting the function equal to zero, factor out the x, and get x and negative x plus one left over, which gives you zero and one as the roots of the function. The formula I like to think about when I use shells is the integral of 2 pi times the shell radius and the shell height. If we go about a vertical line when you do shells, you are always going to integrate with respect to x. In the integral, first I factored out the 2 pi. The limits of integration would be your two roots, 0 and 1. The shell radius is the distance from my shell to the line I'm going about, so in this case it would simply be x. The shell height would be the top curve minus the bottom curve, in this case, negative x squared plus x. Now we have our integral set up. To calculate this, distribute the x and use the power rule, and after some algebra and plugging in, you end up with a volume of pi over 6. Suppose we wanted to go about the line x equals negative 3 instead of the y-axis. Everything is still the same, same formula with the 2 pi and shell radius and shell height. The limits of integration are still from 0 to 1 because that's our given region. The shell height is still the same, top function minus the bottom function. However, we have one thing that's different, the shell radius. The distance to get back to the y-axis is x, but we need three more units to get to the new axis of rotation. Don't get confused with the negative 3. We want the distance, not displacement. Thus, our shell radius is x plus 3. Then, we go ahead and foil everything out and use the basic power rule to solve the integral. You should end up with a volume of 7 pi over 3. So that's all there is to solids of revolution. Whenever given a problem that asks you to calculate a volume of revolution, try to visualize what the function looks like rotated around the given axis, and think about which of the three methods we presented to you would best fit.